So in the last video, we took a look at unique proton environments, uh, and we talked a little bit about how we can tell the different number of signals that would come from a molecule by looking at the symmetry of the molecule and being able to tell which protons were chemically equivalent. If they were chemically equivalent, they would give the same signal. If they were chemically inequivalent, they may give different signals. They most often do. Sometimes, even though they're supposed to give different signals, it just so happens that they'll be very close and maybe you can't tell. But now we're going to take a look at the type of environment of each set of protons. We're going to take a look at what's called the chemical shift. Notice down here our axis, our axis is chemical shift and has a weird kind of units. We're going to talk a little bit first about where those units come from. We might expect that those units would have been hertz because we're looking at uh, the different uh, emission of the uh, radio wave photon that comes off and we would expect that to be in hertz, but it's not. So uh, let's take a look now at chemical shift. So individual NMR instruments have different strength, strength magnets and are calibrated against the standard and the actual frequencies converted to a value that can be compared regardless of the magnet strength. So what that's really telling us is that if we have different magnet strengths, that's going to change, change the energy levels, right? So if we do an experiment with a strong magnet versus an experiment with a somewhat less strong magnet, the frequency uh, that we'd be monitoring would be different. Uh, and it would get very confusing to be looking at these things. So we want something that's independent of the magnet strength or the radio frequency of which the photon protons uh, are emitting. Uh, we do that by using an internal standard. So originally, our internal standard was tetramethylsilane. The reason this was chosen is because the methyl groups are fairly well shielded. They have a lot of electron density around them. And it was expected that not many compounds would have more electron density. So uh, they set this up and they, when we do an experiment, we take a look at the shift in the signal that we're monitoring from the signal that we would get from TMS. And that would be in Hertz, not megahertz, but Hertz. Megahertz, uh, if we're looking at a 60 megahertz instrument, that's the uh, relative amount of energy everything's emitting at. And what we're looking at is the difference between the megahertz uh, of emission of our compound versus the signal from TMS. Okay, so we then divide, we multiply that times 10 to the 6. And we multiply that by the operating frequency of the instrument in hertz. And hence, we get parts per million. So uh, that, that seems a little uh, cloudy. So let's take a look at what we actually mean. So if we're taking a look at benzene, on benzene, on a 60 megahertz instrument, that means that we put our compounds in a magnet. We irradiate them with a radio pulse uh, slightly broad that would be centered around 60 megahertz. That's the radio frequency of which we irradiate. They will emit somewhere around there, but we will look at uh, the difference between uh, the emission from benzene and the emission from TMS, and that turns out to be 436 hertz. And then we just divide by 60 megahertz, and that equals 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 6. If we were to do the same experiment on a magnet uh, that corresponded to an irradiation of 300 megahertz, this is a much stronger magnet. Uh, I forget the strength of the magnet. I think this is around 1.4, and this would be around 7. That's right, this would be around 7 tesla approximately 7 tesla. I forget the exact number. Okay, so now the difference in that frequency between 
the protons on benzene and the protons on TMS is now 2100, 2181 hertz. So you can see that that would get confusing. Uh, we're looking at the same molecule, we would like to see the same number. If we divide them uh, by the strength of the magnet that causes the irradiation in uh, wavelength of 300 megahertz, we get 7.27 ppm. So this is just a way of standardize, standardizing our uh, chemical shift, and we call this the chemical shift. In this instance, it's 7.27 parts per million. So the shift of our particular proton signal is calculated in comparison to TMS. So the hertz cancel out, we're dividing hertz by megahertz, so it's a unitless uh, number, but we talk about parts per million um, indicates that the signals are reported as a fraction of the operating frequency. As it turns out, for proton NMR, most signals appear from 0 to 10. We do see instances where signals come below 0 and a few instances where signals come above 10 ppm. And those are very diagnostic of the chemicals. So let's take a look now uh, and see what I mean by talking about the different field strengths of the instruments. If we have a uh, 60 megahertz uh, machine, uh, our scale from 0 to 10 pm goes from 0 to 600 hertz in the difference. If we have a 300 megahertz machine, our scale goes from 0 to 3000 hertz. But notice that the chemical shifts are the same. So the field strength of the magnet changes the energy separation between spin states. So the distance from TMS in terms of hertz is different, but the chemical shift of a particular system signal is constant. That's the important part here. The chemical shift is constant. And that's the number that we look at when we do our experiments and our analysis of the results. Let's take a look at it in a different fashion. Here's a spectrum for this compound. Okay, one, two, three, four. So it's uh, 3-methyl-3-butanol, or 2-methyl-2-butanol, rather. Uh, so we can take a look at this, and if we kept the hertz the same, our, sig our comp our spectra looks spread out, right? Now, if we plot this instead of on a scale of hertz, we plot it on a scale of ppm, notice now that our signals all come at the same place, but our, our these signals, which we're gonna find out in a little bit, are split, uh, and those splitting patterns actually get spread out. That can be very advantageous because when we do experiments on uh, low megahertz machines, low power machines, it's very spread out and they start to overlap. When we use higher powered machines, the signals get nicely separated. We get much nicer spectra. Uh, so we'll, we'll see that later on when we take a look at some uh, spectrum, but still, we're still talking about the particulars of what's going on in a spectrum. So, what about the chemical shifts? What changes the chemical shifts? So, they're they're related, generally speaking, to three major factors. There's other things that happen and much subtleties, but generally, the hybridization of the carbon will cause a change in chemical shift. So, hydrogens attached to sp2 hybridized carbon get a come in a significantly different place than hydrogens attached to an sp3 carbon or an sp carbon. We've already seen the presence of electronegative atoms uh, or electron, electron attracting groups. So we saw the effect that happened when we replaced 
hydrogen with a chlorine, or if we had things attached to something like a carbonyl group. Those are all very electron withdrawing, and they deshielded our signal and caused it to come at higher ppm. And the other thing that we see, and we, we saw this already, um, but we'll see it again and again, the degree of substitution on the carbon, whether we have a primary, secondary, or tertiary carbon. Uh, so this is a primary carbon. secondary carbon and tertiary carbon. These would all have different signals. So these would come at a different chemical shift than these protons as would these protons. Okay, so uh, those are the, the major factors. Let's take a look at what that means. Uh, early NMRs analyze samples at constant energy over a range of magnetic fields. So we often talk about low field strength as being downfield, and downfield is over here. And it's a little bit confusing because the chemical shifts are higher numbers, but this is downfield and this is upfield. And it has to do with the strength of the magnet uh, that used to be used in the old spectrometers, uh, and that still hangs on. And TMS is very hard far upfield uh, at zero ppm. Here the transition is lower energy, so the energy separation is smaller uh, than it is over here between the two spin states. So let's take a look at this. We've already seen that when we take methane, okay, if we did an NMR experiment with methane, we would see that we only get one signal, it'd be a, it'd be a real nice sing, singlet, and it would come at 1.0 ppm. That, that happens to be where methane comes. If we take one of the hydrogens off and replace it with an iodine, now the remaining three protons on there, they're all chemically equivalent, we only see one signal, and it comes at 2.2 ppm. If instead of iodine we put bromine, which is more electronegative than iodine, our signal would come at 2.7. So see, they're going further and further downfield uh, as we get more and more electronegative groups on there. And when we put chlorine on, 3.1 ppm, and when we put the very electronegative fluorine on there, so methyl fluoride, the protons come at a chemical shift of 4.3 ppms. Notice as well, dichloromethane, dichloromethane, I'm sorry, this is just chloromethane. This is dichloromethane at 5.3. We take another one off, pro chloroform, which has three chlorines and only one proton remaining, comes at 7.3 ppm. That's because we're putting more electronegative groups on here and all of these are sucking electron density away and very much deshielding nuclei of that proton. Uh, and here we see when we have an electronegative group, the further away we get, the less effect it has. So the protons on the carbon attached next to it on a CH2 group, 3.3. Also a CH2 group, but it's further away. It's now two bonds away from the chlorine, 1.6 ppms. And uh, our terminal one in this instance, 0 0.9 ppms. Okay, so that electronegative effect drops off as we get further and further away from it. Uh, chemical shifts start with the standard ppm for the type of proton. Here we're looking at methyl, methylene, okay, methylene is a CH2 group and a methine is a CH group, all else being equal, uh, that is, these are just regular hydrocarbons. Our uh, methyl groups come in at about 0 0.9. It will depend, uh, we're assuming now we just have pure hydrocarbons. 
Uh, methylene groups come in at about 1.2 ppm, slightly downfield. And methines, just CHs, so again, this is a primary, this is a secondary, and this is a tertiary uh, carbon. And these come at 1.7. Now, you don't have to memorize all these things. What we do is, what has happened is there's been many and many experiments done, and this data has been collated over the years, collected and collated, and we use tables that give us kind of average chemical shifts. Uh, you can find these at credible websites. Your textbook will have tables. Uh, I will post some tables on ACORN, uh, all of these different things. Now, we can, they're slightly additive, but we have to be really careful with any type of uh, group additivity. We're better off just to take a look at these tables, and it's all very uh, almost qualitative when we start looking at chemical shifts. Aromatic protons have this thing known as an anisotropic effect. So what happens with aromatic compounds when we apply an external field we get this uh, induced magnetic field, and uh, our protons actually get deshielded uh, if they're outside the ring. If we had protons inside the ring, they would actually get shielded. So all this anisotropic means is that we have properties with different values when measured in different directions. So we're going to see that in just a second. Uh, so aromatic protons are highly deshielded. We're going to see in just a second that they come usually somewhere between 7 and 8 ppms. So our induced magnetic field is actually uh, aligned with the magnet so that we get this deshielding that occurs. Regions outside appear very deshielded. Inside they become very shielded. So if we take a look at these aromatic protons. Notice they're all somewhere between 7 and 8. This there's actually three signals here. We'll see that later on, uh, that there's three signals there. But there's three signals here. And notice now as well, there's protons. That's a CH3 group. Don't forget your bond line diagram. So this is due to the CH3 group, and this is due to the CH2 group. This is our CH2, so that it comes at about 2.6 ppm. And the methyl group comes at about 1.2 ppm, I'm going to guess. I'm going to expand it. Maybe we call that 1.21, 1.22. OK. Because of that anisotropic, uh, dimatic anisotropy, uh, these aromatic protons come out around 7, between 7 and 8. If we were to make a large ring, a large aromatic ring, this is aromatic, and we'll learn about this in a little bit uh, later in the course, but as it turns out, these protons come in about 8.0 ppm. They're actually, because of the symmetry of the molecule, we only see two signals for this. They're, they're equivalent. And these protons on the inside come at minus 1 ppm. So we talk about them as being very shielded. So that's because of the way the induced magnetic field uh, appears uh, in these big aromatic molecules.
So we got to be familiar with PPM values and we take a look at these different charts and I'll send some charts out to you folks uh, very soon. But typical methyl groups uh, of alkanes, 0 0.9. Methylenes, 1.2 and methines, 1.7. Allylic, notice now allylic means that they're attached to a carbon that's attached to a sp2 hybridized carbon they come in about two alkynols interesting they come in about 2.5 and that has to do with the induced uh, field as well uh, hopefully there we go vinyl hydrogen attached to an sp2 hybridized carbon they have a wide range but they come way out in a convenient part of the spectrum uh, don't worry right now we're just uh, showing you where these different things come and then a little bit later in a couple more videos uh, we'll start taking a look at some specific molecules and how we interpret them. Uh, again our aromatic protons between about 7 and 8 this table tells us 6.5 and 8. Aldehydes come way out at 10 and carboxylic acids come way out at 12. This is very diagnostic because there's not much else comes out in this region. So we see something between about 10 and 11, we know it's an aldehyde, and if it's 12 or even 13, it's a carboxylic acid. Now to look at this, our methyl group, which is attached to an aromatic group, is also deshielded at about 2.5. So we could easily confuse protons on an alkyne and protons next to an aromatic group. Okay, and remember when we looked at that spectrum, here, this CH2 was coming right around 2.6. Here we see the charts that we just used. We sometimes see uh, charts like this, which just give us some idea of where our chemical shifts come from. The next thing we want to talk about, the next piece of information, so we've learned that the number of signals is dependent on uh, the unique types of hydrogens, and those unique hydrogens will give different chemical shifts. We can also use information in our NMR to tell how many protons actually are responsible for the signal that we're looking at okay so uh, we've already seen that's what this thing is for and there's a way to tell that that signal gives us three protons this gives us two protons and this grouping gives us five protons and again there's actually three signals buried in there but it gives us five protons so how do we do that we integrate the HNMR the old way of doing an integration we would sweep and we would be in integral mode and then we call it integrations because it looks like an integration we're also measuring the area under the curve okay but you'll see that this distance from here to here and this distance from here to here are in a ratio of 1.5 to 1. So we only get the relative amount. If we were looking at this particular spectrum, we would know that uh, the ratio here is 2 to 3. The real ratio, this is our chemical compound, is 4 to 6. And the integration ratio is 1 to 1.5. These are all equivalent, okay? But it just so happens that this molecule has 3, 6, 10 protons, 6 of which come from this signal and 4 of which come from this signal. And we do that by measuring the distance between 
the top and the bottom of those integration lines. You will often see modern instruments, instead of doing this type of integration, we still typically do that, but you can also just get it printed down here. It'll give you some number, and it might give you 1.5 and 1. The ratio will be the same. So remember, it's just a relative amount. If we went back to here, this would integrate, we would be 5 to 2 to 3. Uh, if we were to do the integration, oh, that's not very good. Uh, and this is going to be 5. Okay, we have one last thing to look at in terms of our characteristics of NR spectra. The next video will look at uh, now why these signals are split.